like to greet each one, precious name of Jesus, this morning. Vern, you have just made an excellent opening for that which the Lord seemed to be laying on my heart. You know, for us, this past week was a little bit different. We, week and a half. You know, when someone your own age, a good friend of yours, meets eternity, it just does something for you. You know, we're that age. It could happen to us. You know, I'm standing here this morning, but what's going on in inside? I don't know. For Brother Paul, four weeks ahead of that time, he had a stroke, and then they discovered he had cancer, and a couple weeks later, he was in the grave. You know, what's, what's going on? It makes you think. And it's good to think along those lines. I think of the verse there in Ecclesiastes where it says, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to, to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance of the heart is made better. You know, sadness or when we think of those things, we think beyond what Brother Learn was talking about, what success or what is success in God's eyes. Isn't success in God's sight to use the opportunity that God has provided that we can be with him in glory? to allow our hearts to be redeemed, to walk in a perfect way before him. As I was thinking along those lines, standing in the graveyard, we mow the grave, our own graveyard, or the one beside us there, and standing out there in that other graveyard, I had to think of something. You know, on some of the tombstones, you'll see They have little sayings, little slogans, things that maybe they endeavored to live for while they were here. I think there's one in our graveyard where there's a big tractor on there, and he's a farmer, you know. They wanted him to remember him, evidently, by being a big farmer. But some of them have the saying, resting in peace. And it got in my heart, my mind to think, what are we, are we resting? Are we resting in peace? Um, What is rest? I think the opening there showed us a little bit of what really helps us to rest. That's contentment. It's one of the primary things I think that uh, would enter into the picture of causing us to rest. Now, after a hard day's work, maybe you had a difficult day, lots of manual labor, and you sit down, and what do you do? You rest. Is that all that's included in rest? I think there's more things that are included. I'd like to go back to the to help us to understand rest in the way that I'd like to meditate upon it this morning. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. And we have some interesting things there that relate to resting, and yet we can't quite comprehend it. Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. And we know this is after God had created the earth and put everything in place. And then it says in verse 2, And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that it, in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now, did God rest because he was tired? He was weary. 
fatigued? I don't believe so. Isaiah 40, verse 28 says, Had thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. God doesn't become weary. and He doesn't become tired like us humans. And maybe we wouldn't have, if we wouldn't have fallen or if Adam and Eve wouldn't have sinned in the garden, we might have not been getting tired either. I don't know how that would be. But we do know that we now become tired when we labor and we do physical labor. God rested. Why? His resting consisted of being very pleased and delighted in the contemplation of his own wisdom, power, and grace. There was a feeling of satisfaction and accomplishment, and he was pleased with it. It was a rest to him. Now, I think you, you have experienced that very same thing already in your labors. Sometimes, I still remember one thing that... Um, my grandfather used to do, we used to do painting with him. Uh, he was a known person to do those things, and we helped him. I helped him for four summers when school was out, painting buildings. And he said he enjoyed doing that. And the thing that he enjoyed about it was it was a lot of labor, especially when you had to scrape the old paint that was peeling off and it was dirty work and then we wouldn't paint with a sprayer. He didn't allow that because in his experience it didn't last as long. He painted with a brush and so we did that same thing too. Nine hours a day swinging a brush and you learned to brush on both hands so that you could change off your tired hand or your arm and uh, you could paint further. We didn't have lifts. We'd use ladders. We had lots of ladders, and we'd take them up and down and climb them. But the thing he enjoyed about it was the place looked better after it was finished. It was taken care of. It, there was a preservation there. It was more than just better looking. It was he preserved the building. Of course, nowadays we don't have that as much because we have vinyl siding, we have steel siding, we have pre-painted things that last and last and even longer than that sometimes but we used to have need to paint so that it would preserve a building and the siding would last but there was a delight in a finished product and it was a type of rest and satisfaction tells us here in verse 3 that uh, God blessed and sanctified the seventh day it was a holy day a day to remember God and bring him praise is a rest. So we see several things there in the very beginning of what rest possibly meant to God. And it can also mean that to us if we look at it in that way. Resting to regain physical strength. We know what that's all about. In Exodus 23, verse 12, it says, Six days thou shalt work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest. And it goes, in that verse it says that thy ox and thy son and thy stranger, anyone under your domain, need to rest on the seventh day. That thou be refreshed, it said. So that time of setting aside as a refreshment to the physical body. God uh, ordained it to be that way. Working day and night is not what God calls the same as resting on the seventh day. I believe each day he has ordained a similar kind of thought that the night is to refresh us for the next day. So we need to keep those, that principle in mind even in a daily working operation. That we use our time wisely and we preserve and refresh the physical body. 
Mark 6.31 says, And he said unto them, this was when there was a time of stress, an emotional stress, I believe. He was talking to the disciples, and it was right after King Herod had beheaded John the Baptist, and John's head was brought to Herodias on a platter or in a bowl. It was a request that was made, and Herod had done that. Now, that doesn't seem like a very delightful thing at all. But that's what she requested because she hated John. She didn't like John because John had talked to her about her illegal or her unrighteous marriage to her, to uh, Brother Herod's brother's wife. You know, he, he had taken her to be his own in an, an adulterous situation. And he had talked to Herod about that, and Herodias didn't like that. So she had John the Baptist beheaded. That was a gruesome thing. And as we think of the disciples, as they were contemplating that, then it was probably a lot of uneasiness. And there was a lot of fear involved against the disciples. But Jesus said, to them, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Because there was so much to do, they couldn't even find time to eat. So he said, let's go out on the mountain and refresh ourselves. Let, let God help us to learn true contentment and, and to just accept what has happened and to go on from here. Uh, not to become too emotional about it, yet their emotions were stirred. So that's an avenue of, that's a blessing that we can have as we think of re, uh, refreshing ourselves uh, in, in a rest. God expects us to take proper care of our physical bodies, and we need to do that. We have a tendency, especially if we have those uh, thoughts that Brother Laverne was bringing out of pushing forward to su be successful, to do and accomplish things. Let's be careful. Let's give proper due care to our physical bodies that we don't hinder uh, the functionality of our body and keeping us, maybe bringing us to an early death, possibly even. Then we think rest for the spiritual body. That's the thing I was mostly thinking about and meditating upon in, in the uh, thoughts here. I failed to read a scripture portion I wanted to read in Psalm. In the opening here, Psalms 116, I'd like to read verses 6 to 9 before we go any further. Psalms 116, reading verses 6 to 9. And it talks about rest here. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul. For the Lord hath dealt bondively with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. As we think of that, it brings us back to the thought of a rest for the spiritual body. We notice here that David is talking about returning into him. His life was preserved because of simplicity. It was brought low, and he helped, and God helped him. As we think, when we are lifted up in pride and we uh, exalt ourselves, we push for those things that bring honor and glory to ourselves, and those things tear down, take away from that rest that is that which preserves and builds up and strengthens. It's that rest which, uh, it's not a rest. It gets us on edge and it helps us to falter, bringing us low. But then God helped him to see Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Again, when we are content, we think of those things that we have and not about the things that we don't have. And those are the things that bring uh, a rest to us. We're thankful. 
I think back of the time we have all kinds of things. I think back, I don't know, but I remember Grandpa and Grandma and Mom, Dad, talking about the time of the Depression when things were very tight, when there was little possibly to eat. Uh, I remember Dad talking about mashed potato sandwiches to going to school, and he went to a public school. That would even be more embarrassing uh, carrying your own lunch because there was no lunch there for you. And then to have, what would you say, unsubstantial food, you know, not a ham sandwich, but a mashed potato sandwich. I, I can't imagine that, but that's what he had sometimes because that's all grandma had. They had potatoes, they had gardens, and so they could raise their potatoes and they were used over and over. And so those were things that they had. It filled their stomach, and they were blessed by it. They, he, was, he lived to be my father. And so, you know, those things, we need to count the blessings we have and not to look forward because, and there's a rest in that. There's, there's a satisfaction that meets the need. The divine presence gives rest, trusting in that divine presence. God Almighty, Exodus 33, 14 says, And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And if we look at the setting of that story or of that verse, we will see that that was the time when the Israelites were to take over the land but they were not being faithful and they were doing their own thing and God was becoming displeased with them. And he had told Moses, you go up to the promised land and I'm going to bless you. I'll be with you and I will help you. I will give you rest. But the other people, he said, they haven't been following me. And so I want you to go up and establish that land of milk and honey. And Moses said, I won't do that. I want the people to go along. And he had a heart for them. That was a rest for, for Moses. Even though Moses was faithful, he wanted the people of God to go with him. And he had a heart for them. He didn't want to be there by himself. But God promised that he would, that the, God would be with him and he will give him rest. He will do the same to those who follow and are obedient. And we notice as we go on that the, uh, the children of Israel then changed their way and they said, we will follow after God and we will go with you and, be a, and also experience that rest. Psalm 23 verse 2 gives us another thought about the divine presence giving rest. When he talks about he leads, beside, he leads me beside the still waters, and he provides green pastures for us. That's what the shepherd will do, he says. He leads us beside the still waters. The still waters talks to me in, in several things. It's not troubling waters. It's waters that's calm, that's refreshing. Waters that will meet my need. And, of course, we know the word of God is also a water of life. And the green pastures provide food, meets our needs for, uh, for physical growth that the body needs. Uh, it's food, it's bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand pleasures forevermore. Do we, are we satisfied with that which Jesus can provide, that which comes from God, that which will give us rest? It's when the stomach is filled and we're not hungry anymore, there's a type of rest there. Satisfying rest is found in God. The Lord is my shepherd, as Psalm 23, 1 says. 
He is my shepherd, he says. He careth for his sheep, John 10. If we read John 10, we'll see how he is the good shepherd and he goes out of his way for us. Jesus knows his flock. He has a communication with them. He fellowships with them. There's an intimacy there. The Lord is my shepherd. He knoweth his flock. He is also in John 10, it tells us he's the door. And as we think of the door, it's the opening into the fold. It's that place where we can go in and out, where we can find shelter and also go out and witness and meet others and to share one with another. He's the door. He knows each one that comes in and out. And if the wolf comes, the wolf is not allowed inside. That's a, do you call that, uh, count that as a rest in your life? To know that when I'm doing something or about to do something that might be harmful to me, that might be that which destroys my relationship with God, there's a conscience that pricks me and he tells me, is this the wise thing to be doing? Is this a wolf that's trying to slip in? It's a blessing. And because of that, we can rest that God knows everything. Now we, when we went to Iowa, it doesn't seem right to have that happen that happened there. We don't understand, but we can have full assurance and rest in it that God doesn't make any mistakes. And he took the brethren to go to glory with him or to be with him in glory and away from us. It's going to leave a hole at the table or an empty spot at the home, in the family, in the church. There's a lot of unanswered questions that probably relate to the widow there. How will life go on from here? Who will provide the income and, and et cetera? But we could trust and rest in the fact that God makes no mistakes and that he has ordained it to be so. And it can be a blessing to us, a type of rest, if we allow it to be. Or we can become emotional and all upset and worry and bring condemnation to our spiritual life. It eventually will if we continue that way. Also in John 10, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Sacrificial love that endures, continues, will go on and on. It's not dependent uh, upon the circumstances. I do not run and leave you when trouble comes, Jesus was saying. I will be there. I will be with you. Be by their, your side and to sustain and comfort you. What a blessing that can be. It's a rest knowing that we're not alone. We can have someone by our side even though we he can't be seen. We can talk to him and we can feel him. We can pray to him and it can be there in time of trouble or in time of blessing. The life I give is abundant. It's not just meeting the needs so that we can continue, but it's the bare necessities. It takes more, it gives more than just the bare necessities when we're talking about abundance. Abundance is an overflowing, more than what we really need. He gives us everything that will imp imminently bless us and make us happy. <clears throat> There's other things that are involved when he is our shepherd. He gives us abundance of grace, love, life, and salvation. He also is with us. God is with us. Jehovah, the anointed one, the father, the redeemer of mankind. He is by our side and it's in abundance that he is. The communion of the saints is a blessing that we can have. We can be side by side with one another to help each other and to share with our sorrows and our griefs and our joys. All those we have those of like precious faith to accompany us. What a blessing. 
That's a rest. A fulfilling rest is having the Father, Jesus, by our side. He's a redeemer of mankind. He has redeemed me. Also, he says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. What a precious promise. We, should, we can be saved. There's protection. Protection in the fold when we are inside. And he allows us to enter in and be a part of that protection. Where God is, we need not fear. We know Satan comes around and he would like to show us that he is powerful. But what he does is get us into a pinch and he lets us there. He has no answers. In fact, he tries to tell us that he has an answer and it just gets us in deeper and deeper and deeper. But it really has no way out. Why? Because he's defeated. He's already been defeated. He knows he's defeated. God has sent him in his place, and that place is hell. It's there. And we need to be careful that we don't allow his ways to influence us. It's not that which brings rest. Can you tell me, in hell, where there's smoke, that's what uh, fire and brimstone is, Burning brimstone creates a tremendous amount of smoke, choking smoke. You can't hardly breathe. And there's a sense of falling, continuously falling. All those things that relate to, and the fire that burns. If one drop of water would have helped the rich man, or he thought it would, how hot will the fire be? Is that rest? Is that a rest that is sustainable? Not at all. It's a torment, and that's what Satan has for us, and that's where he is also, will be in the future. We also think of rest as being having the heart of the master. As we think of, of rest in a fold, we're entered in, there's safety, there's protection, there's pasture. It sustains life and builds us up. We're surrounded with others, and God is in the midst. What a blessed picture that is. And then when we leave, we can go out and testify of those things that God has done for us. The heart of the master includes everyone. It's available for everyone. There's no one that's left out. I heard someone say, and I reproved him for it there at the funeral. He said, I'm one of the black sheep in the family. I said, God has no black sheep, quote, in that sense. He has Negro saints, that kind of black he has in the fold, but he has no black sheep. And that's talking about those that are left out or cast out or not acceptable. God has and made available the plan of salvation to everyone. Luke 15, verses 1 to 7, Jesus gave the parable about the lost sheep, how he leaves the 99 and he goes to search for the lost one. Rest is knowing that someone cares this much for him, wants him to be inside the kingdom, and he goes and he searches until he finds it. And the, Scripture there says, when he has found it, he puts it on his shoulder and he goes back to the flock where the rest are. And he says, rejoice with me because the one that was lost has been found. That's the heart of the master. Second, uh, 1 Timothy 2.4 says, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. That's the heart's desire of the master of God. He wants all to be saved. He died for all and he wants all to be saved. Will you accept that saving? Will you accept that rest that he would like to present to you? Now this next thought, next point, is something that seems contradictory. Rest in working. Rest is found in working. 
Have you experienced that? I've experienced that and even in physical labor. And I think each one of you children have that's gone to school already. How is it? My, my mind just now goes back to uh, Judy when she was at home and, uh, and they had to work in the garden. It was a hard work. And then finally mom, their mom said, uh, well, you can have a little time off. You can go play. And then they went riding bicycle. It was just a fun thing to do. And was it sitting under the shade tree and resting? No, it was riding bicycle. It was a refreshment. And the same thing in school. You know, the students are studying. You're weary of your mental brain's not working quite right because you studied. Then you go out to recess, and what do you do? You play ball. Is that resting? Yes, it is. It's a rest. Even when you're doing something and working can be the same way. Some work is that which stabilizes your mind and, and, and relaxes your muscles and, 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 and it's enjoyable to do. One of those things is shelling peas. Uh, I, it's not the most enjoyable thing to be out there and picking the peas. It, it, hot sun and bending and picking, but then to sit on the porch in the shade and to shell the peas, it's a work, but it's relaxing and it's enjoyable. So we can do that. But then in likewise, in Christian service is a work. And when we are laboring for the master, we also do the things that are important in his kingdom. That's going out and meeting other people's needs. Matthew, there's a lot of scriptures that point these out. But Matthew 11, 29, a very familiar one. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's easy to be born. God has a way and it's a rest for us as we labor for him in the kingdom, even though it might be work and labor. God looks at the overall picture, not just the immediate. That overall picture is not that the reward might not be immediately, but it is coming. And there can be a satisfaction in knowing and having that confidence, trusting in God to oversee it all and to meet the needs. There's a satisfaction and peace in a job completed, a type of rest. And that's, I think, part of the fact that talked about in the very beginning when God rested. He looked back over what had happened and what had come to pass, and he was satisfied, and there was a rest there, a job completed, a type of rest. Even if the result is not as you expected. I'd like to add that to the, to the end of this, because many times when we do things and we labor, we do and we labor for those things that build up and that strengthen and that come forth and are that which in, causes the church to grow. And yet, sometimes those things don't come out like you want to. Maybe you have expected to do something that will bring a uh, satisfaction and then it doesn't do that. It's, it, it, there's a hindrance there. But there's also, uh, after you have done it and, and completed it, there's the knowledge there that you have done what you could. It's like that widow that felt like she wasn't worthy to touch the master so, garment, and yet she did and was healed. She did what she could. She, we also think of the Mary that came to Jesus and anointed his head and washed his feet. And, and there was criticism there. Uh, she had anointed Jesus' feet with the tears that she had and wiped them with her hair. And there was criticism that the, the oil that was spent there was a waste. One of the disciples even said that or was the one who said that. And Jesus 
rebuked him for it. She had done what she could. She had anointed him to the burial before the time of the burial. It was a blessing, and it was to be a memorial. They were to continue it, and we have it today yet to remind us of the blessings of that. Obedience and faithfulness brings rest. Sometimes things don't turn out like you want or had you, as you had expected. But if you are faithful and you are obedient, even though you don't see the result, it, there's a rest there that you have done what you could and what you should because God laid it upon your heart, even though there doesn't seem to be a blessing there or a reward or it working out for you. But then God can see the overall picture and he sees far beyond what our physical eyes can see and our life can even portray. There are other blessings. Ecclesiastes 5 tells, 5.12 tells us, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. We understand that. That's not hard. When you labor hard, you lay down and your body is physically wore out. You rest in a satisfying way and you're refreshed when you get up. It's sweet. It's that which uh, builds up the physical part of us. And in spiritual things, it's the same way. Spiritual labor in Matthew 10, 42. And whosoever shall give unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Sometimes we think it's insignificant what I'm doing. And I would probably say that sometimes on the sister's side, many times you think some of the things you're doing are insignificant. But God notices. And he knows what's been done. And he will also reward. We will not lose our reward when we do things in the right spirit and in the right way. Now, if we do things to bring honor and glory to ourselves, Jesus says we have our reward. That, that's right there. But if we do it out of a heart of love and a, a meeting someone's need or to uh, help someone, that's a type of, that turns out to be a glory to God and it's a type of rest for us. We knowing that we have fulfilled what he has asked us to do. And we can be blessed by it. <clears throat> In Ephesians 6, 8, Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether it be bond or free. Again, showing us a scripture here, making known that those things that we do, God will notice and will bring a reward. It may be, Later on, we don't know when, but God notices and he will not forget. And it doesn't matter whether you are a servant or whether you are a master. We need to do those things and then that's a type of rest for us. Rest is appropriated by faith. I'd like to read several scriptures here now and rather than just talking about it in Hebrews, Turn with me to Hebrews 3. Talking about what rest can do in relation to uh, being appropriated or caused by faith and what it takes. Hebrews 3, the book of better things in Hebrews 3 there. I'd like to read the first uh, eight verses, and it goes like this. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that buildeth all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for he testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, 
if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm and to the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost saith, today you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, day of provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works forty day forty years <clears throat> and was grieved. We could Continue, but I'm not going to. But here we notice that we hold the faith unto the end. That's the important part. And I had to think of that as I observed the brother there in the casket. He was gone. His body was there, but he had remained faithful to the end. Some of the testimonies and some of the things that were said up until the last Reveal those things. We trust that he is in glory with God. We don't know. We don't make the decision. But the evidences of that we've seen help us to understand and rest in that. We need to, there's a real rest there when we can trust God up until the very end. In Psalm 23 also it tells us that he will be with us as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't have to fear because we have that confidence. We have that trust. We have that rest in him. <clears throat> Hebrews eleven six. there's a verse that says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It's through faith that we need to that we can have this rest because we trust in him. Then I'd like to turn the page over to Hebrews 4 and read a few more verses concerning rest. Reading the first four verses. Let us therefore fear lest the promise of being left us of... Let me read that again. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of... In, Entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not be, being mixed with faith in, that they, in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, I will in my wrath, if they will enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Here we see that <clears throat> rest is attained and can be attained, but it can be lost. We need to be careful that we practice it in our daily life. Those that heard it, but they didn't obey it, didn't believe it, and it wasn't a rest to them. It became that which took them away from God, and their rest departed. I think of a song, Be Ready When He Comes, as I think of that. Our daily life needs to be such as to walk in rest, to be at rest, to have God to be in our midst. And then it can be a rest for us. And we can be prepared to rest in peace at our end. <clears throat> we now have another assistance that is very important that helps us in living victorious. And as I think of it, the fellow minister I was working with this week, uh, we were talking about it, you know, 10 days after the ascension of Christ, which we have just, it was last week. It's what the German would say, pinched, or it's the uh, time when the Holy Spirit was given. And the cal on the calendar, you will see it also talking about the the Feast of Weeks, which is a re reminder that the children of Israel were to keep it in remembrance of the spring harvest and give thanks to God for that. 
It was a time of rest because they had food to eat. But on the calendar, it says Shavuot, something like that. But it talks about the Feast of Weeks or that of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given. We have, and that was 50 days after the resurrection. It's the Comforter was sent, which is the Holy Spirit, to live in every Christian. And the Amish will probably be reading Acts 2 in relation to that, because this is the weekend. We have that Comforter to be in us as we think of the Holy Spirit was given at that time to the apostles there in Acts 2. The Holy Spirit will give us rest. He will be with us to guide us, to empower us, to strengthen us, to reveal truth to us, to help us to resist Satan and to bring joy into our lives. The world has no rest because its author has nothing to offer in relation to rest. Only God can give us true rest. Then we think of the eternal rest. That is the glories of heaven. When I lie in a box to be buried at the end of physical life, I want to be resting in the love of my Savior and Redeemer. <clears throat> Second Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8, Paul testifying, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Are you desiring rest in your spiritual being? It can be found. It can be found in God. It can be found in Jesus and that salvation that was wrought for me and you. Shall we stand for closing prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, thank you for these precious portions of scriptures that talk about that which is satisfying in life, that which comforts, that which brings joy and happiness and peace. Lord, help us to be prepared on our last day to rest in peace. Father, we pray for those who have not experienced that rest in their lives, and yet you're still calling out to them. You have a desire for them. You want all men to be saved. So we pray, Lord, that you would speak to their hearts again and draw them toward you, that they might be redeemed and come to know the only one, the door of the sheepfold, the good shepherd, that we might have life and might have it more abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. You may be seated.